is a piece from Psychology Today by Frank Sonnenberg. A promise is a promise. Do you think before you make a promise to someone? What if you can't deliver on your word? Does it really matter? The world isn't going to come to an end, is it? Well, actually, no. But have you considered? Many people are pretty casual about making promises. As a result, promises are frequently made at the drop of a hat with no real intention of keeping them. Let's do lunch. I'll call you later, and I'll be there in five minutes. Are all examples of throwaway promises that are frequently made but seldom kept. However, this casual attitude can have real consequences. When you break a promise, no matter how small it may seem to you, alarm bells aren't going to go off, but it can damage a relationship or your reputation. Think about it. When someone else breaks a promise to you or gets caught in a lie, doesn't that make you feel violated or cheated? You can't help wondering whether you were wrong to ever trust that person. Getting away with a lie can also be dangerous because it fools liars into believing they're invincible and have little chance of getting caught, even if they're in the White House. Before you know it, lying can become a habit, forcing liars to spend precious time and energy keeping their stories straight. Once others learn about the lie, some people may forgive, but they surely will not forget. There was a time when keeping your word held a special significance. We took great pride in being of good character. Personal integrity was both valued and expected. That was the time when everybody knew everyone else's family and you wouldn't do anything that would cast a shadow on your family's good name. I would add that you probably were going to get caught, too. It was a time when integrity was instilled in children at a very early age and was viewed as instrumental in achieving success. The truth is, our world may have changed, but the importance of integrity has not. While we may not know it, everyone in our own town, the world is still smaller than you think. Create some bad news and you'll learn this for yourself. When you operate with integrity, what you say will be taken at face value, your intentions will be assumed honorable, and your handshake will be as good as a contract. Most importantly, you can take great pride in the standards you've set for yourself and sleep well at night knowing that your conscience is clear. As for others, just when they think they're fooling the world, they'll realize that they are only fooling themselves. A promise is a promise, after all. Later this month, our Jewish friends will be celebrating their highest of holy days, Yom Kippur. It is the Day of Atonement the day of making up for broken promises, for dealing with good intentions that failed, for making things right. It's about becoming whole again, becoming at one, at one, at one meant atonement, becoming at one again, if you will, within yourself. So as we delve deeper this month into the promises we make, and those made to us, the Jewish tradition offers some interesting concepts on forgiveness. They differ in intensity from Christian practices. In order to atone for sin, the good Jew must go in person and to the person who has been wronged and ask forgiveness directly. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> now think about that for a moment. You've broken a promise to someone. Maybe you've hurt them quite badly, even if you had not intended to do so. And you know it. You know you've done this. I expect most of us know that sick feeling we can get when we've failed someone, especially someone close to us. 
And fessing up to it is hard. It can require courage sometimes. The good Jew has to go and connect directly with the wrong party, face their potential anger, feel the burning shame of confession, and be prepared to do whatever is possible to make things right again. That's hard. The alternative, however, is walking away with this piece of you, this broken piece of you, unfixed, unhealed. Assuming that it happens more than once and you get someone incredible, then you get increasingly isolated, increasingly cut off from your community of affection. It is a path of bitterness. Correcting our course, getting back on the right path is a key to spiritual and mental health. But what happens if the wronged party isn't ready to forgive you yet? Well, the Jewish tradition says you must approach them three times and ask for forgiveness. And if you are refused each time, then and only then can you turn to Yahweh and seek forgiveness from him or her. This reminds us that promise-making and promise-breaking are two-way streets. At least two people are involved when promises are made to others. I might screw up and fail to deliver on a promise for all kinds of reasons, some even good reasons, and I might feel genuinely sorry for my actions. But forgiveness goes both ways. The wronged party has to get past their hurt to be able to forgive and to move on. And that can also be difficult. Some people, <laughs> some people can get so wrapped up in the broken promise that they get trapped by it. Some people cannot get past the hurts that have been done to them. I'm not judging this. I'm merely observing that some people can't get past the hurt. They wear it like a badge of honor or an oddly comforting blanket. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but should it stop the contrite offender from moving on with her or his life? Judaism says no. That three tries, three genuine tries, is enough. The Jewish tradition recognizes that just as you had no right to harm in the first place, the hurt party has no right to hold the repentant promise baker, breaker hostage for a lifetime. Some relationships cannot be mended after breaking a pledge. That's just the way it is. There is no judgment on either party in this three tries practice, but rather a very human acknowledgement that we all have challenges in our life, we all meet them differently, and we all have different timelines. The expectation, however, is that we get a chance to learn and to grow and to move toward living better lives, having been changed by this experience of confession, forgiveness, and atonement. Forgiveness is available to everyone who genuinely, genuinely tries to atone. Now, directly seeking forgiveness feels pretty arduous to me. Certainly worse than my Catholic upbringing where I confessed anonymously to a priest, said a few prayers, and I was absolved. Or other Christian traditions where it's even easier, where a prayer of general confession at a service and you are free to go out again and start all over. This Jewish thing has consequences. That's challenging. But maybe consequences is what we need to strengthen the commitment to keep promises we make to others. As a minister, I'm on a list with Alcoholics Anonymous. And from time to time, I'm asked to help someone do their fifth step. I did one last week with an elderly man trying to get clean again after nearly 50 years after his first time through the doors of AA. In the fifth step, people in recovery, having undertaken an inventory of their wrongs, quote, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to one other person the exact nature of our wrongs. 
And then a few steps later, because this is not the whole deal, a few steps later in step nine, they then go as directly as possible to the person or people they have harmed in their addiction and own up to the hurt that they have done. That's a consequence. It seems that that friend named Bill long ago had at least a passing familiar familiarity with Yom Kippur practices. Last week in a sermon about the promises we make to self, I spoke about how the Hebrew Bible is a history book of promises made, promises broken, and promises remade, mostly between the leaders of the Hebrew tribes and Yahweh. The High Holy Day is a continuation of that theme. The message is very simple. Nobody's perfect. You're going to screw up sooner or later, and you have a choice to make when you do. If you want to get right with the other person, and right with your values, and right with your God if you believe in God. Now this may seem an odd way to begin to discuss a sermon on promises we make to others, but let's face it, whatever our best intentions and even well-meaning actions, we are <laughs> going to screw up and break the promises we make to other people. Certainly I do. So let's begin with that assumption. What is it in our makeup that makes promise-keeping a challenge so difficult for so many of us? Well, there are a lot of factors. For one thing, many who study such things feel that we have different kinds or degrees of promise that we make. The psychologist David McGraw names three categories, each carrying a kind of different weight of commitment. The first one, he says, are strong, healthy promises. Promises that I am fully committed to keep, he says. You can count on me. If I am unable to keep my promise, I will renegotiate my original promise. That is, I'll meet you for coffee at 8 a.m. I will complete my assignment on time, or I will let you know about it. A promise is a promise, and I accept the firm obligation to deliver. I imagine that this is how most of us think we make almost all of our promises. But is that really true? I think a lot of us, including me, have at least sometimes fallen into the second category that McGraw calls shallow promises. It looks like a strong promise, but an unspoken condition exists. Yes, I'll play golf with you on Saturday unless it rains or something else comes up. The comic strip Zitz that I copied in your order of service this week illustrates the shallow promise quite nicely. Mom asks teenager Jeremy if he has any weekend plans. Oh, sure, I'll probably decide to do something with friends, and then when a more interesting possibility comes along, I'll bail on the first thing, and later on when the second thing falls apart, I'll just end up moping around here. Unbelievable, says Mom. At least I have plans. Those of us who use social media to set up event pages know the meaning of shallow promises only too well. People click going all the time to your event, but event planners know very, very well that a substantial number of those folks will not show up. Jeremy's plans seem to be the increasing norm in society these days, casually saying yes with no thought or weight given to the meaning of that promise. McGraw then names his third category with a very harsh term. He calls them criminal promises. Promises that at the moment we make them, we have no intention of keeping. Like, my son asks me to play with him when I'm done, and I tell him, yeah, maybe. Harry Chapin's song, Cats in the Cradle, reminds us that breaking promises, especially McGraw's criminal ones, have consequences. In the song, the father who broke promises to his son having his grows up, ha, ends up having his grown son break promises to him. A kind of karma. What you put out there comes back to you. The concept of keeping our promises, keeping our word, honoring our vows, has become watered down. And I will be the first to own my own part in that. I confess to having made and broken my share of shallow promises and maybe even some of the bigger ones too. 
It is true, by the way, that preachers often write sermons that they are the ones they most need to hear. Now, here's an odd thing about this, though. I, I turned to the sources of moral wisdom looking for the importance of truth and honesty and promise making, and I didn't find anything. I look at our own statement of principles in the Unitarian Universalist Church, and there's no mention of truth or honesty or promise making. Maybe it's simply assumed as a given. And yet, then I looked at the Ten Commandments, and it only appears as the Ninth Commandment in Exodus, and then only in the matter of not bearing false witness against your neighbor. Well, it's very specific and defined. It's curious how the formal moral codes often leave this promise thing out. Once, as Frank Sonnenberg noted, the appearance of honor appeared to be everything, and keeping one's oath and one's promise was a critical part of being honorable, but it doesn't seem that's so much anymore. Even perjury in court is seldom prosecuted. Certainly, we don't have much respect in public life for people who make their public promises. Huffington Post reported uh, a survey from this past year that politicians are rated as the least trusted of professions, just 18% of people believe them all the time. They're followed by automobile salespeople at 28%, and interestingly, pollsters at 34%. <laughs> CEOs, bankers, lawyers, and realtors all come in around 50%. Now, when the people who are supposedly leading our society are perceived to be largely or completely untrustworthy, why should the rest of us bother with promises? Frank Sonnenberg in our reading has the answer. When you break a promise, no matter how small it may seem to be to you, alarm bells aren't going to go off, but it can damage a relationship or your reputation. Think about it. When someone else breaks a promise to you or gets caught in a lie, doesn't that make you feel violated or cheated? You can't help wondering why you were wrong to ever trust that person in the first place. Getting away with a lie can also be dangerous because it fools liars into believing they're invincible and that they have little chance of getting caught. And before you know it, lying can become a habit, forcing liars to spend precious time and energy keeping their stories straight. I suppose that's why we routinely change, if not governments, then leaders of government because we only put up with their falseness and their lack of promise keeping for so long. And then go ahead and try another one. Like that's going to work. We live in such a complex and fast moving age. There is so much false news, subterfuge, and anti science propaganda that fly in the face of proven fact. Finding information we can trust is becoming increasingly difficult. You really have to work at it. And it seems to me that finding people we can trust is becoming more and more important. And perhaps if we hope to find them, then the first step is to become them. To be the trustworthy person that other people will come to with expectations of honor. Only make promises you plan to keep. And when you fail, seek to atone for them as soon as possible. Follow the path of Yom Kippur. Trust, faith, covenant, promise-keeping, atonement, all of these are two-way streets. And the first step along each of these streets of confession, promise-making, forgiveness, all of those things, the first step is up to you. Amen. Linda Underwood writes, All this talk of saving souls. Souls weren't meant to save, like Sunday clothes that give out at the seams. They were made for wear. They come with lifetime guarantees. Don't save your soul. Pour it out like rain on cracked, parched earth. 
give your soul away or pass it like a candle flame. Sing it out loud or laugh it up the wind. Souls were made for hearing, breaking hearts, for puzzling dreams, remembering August flowers, forgetting hurts. These men who talk of saving souls, they have the look of bullies who blow out candles before you sing happy birthday. And they want the world to be in alphabetical order. I will spend my soul playing it out like sticky string into the world so I can catch every last thing I touch.